Ultima Pinta Producciones presenta La Nueva Forma Podcast con Benjamín y Mateo. La Nueva Forma contiene contenido para adultos, incluido el sexo, las drogas y los bobos. Se recomienda la discreción oyente. Como todos los tíos, marcando territorio y dándonos de hostias cuando lo único que os gustaría sería follar el uno con el otro. ¡Eso es lo que os gustaría! Vale, Sofo. Ya tú. Vamos, vamos, vamos. Vamos, vamos. Vamos, vamos. Vamos, vamos. Vamos, Welcome to the new way with the Ben and Matt. Oh, you knew on. it was going to be something ridiculous like that. Didn't I, I, I didn't actually. Um, anyways, thanks again for <laughs> listening this week. Of course, I am back. Uh, I guess after not so long of a departure, but it feels like it's been like well, we four re- months. Yeah, we recorded two back to back. Right. Um, and then you were out, it was a couple of weeks, and I imagine it feels longer for you, and anyone that listened to last week's podcast, it probably feels really long, because it's maybe the technically (laughs) most poor podcast, like, I'm eager right now to record as many as we can, as quick as we can, so that it just gets buried somewhere in the middle. It, It was, well, it was our 21st podcast. I think everyone has a sloppy 21st, so I think it's sort of fitting for oh, us. Oh, ah, okay. Well, that, that actually makes a little bit of sense. But a little bit. Anyways, yeah, I mean, even beyond doing the back-to-back, I mean, because we did them that week and, and had a back-to-back, and then I we ended up in the hospital faster than I anticipated. Uh, yeah, back-to-back children. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so spending a week in the hospital, and then even though I took another week and pretty much spent mostly at home, now I'm back at work full-time. It seems like about a year has passed since we did our last I don't know podcast. how you do it. Like, what's like, what was your first like <laughs> father realization <laughs> moment? You know, I I saw Ben like the the night they got home, and I don't think I've ever seen Ben more just like bedraggled. Is probably the most proper word. I was, like just I, in no, a I was happy. I, it, was, it was very. I mean, because we were we were adjusting still at that point. Yeah. Now we've gotten into a nice routine where we're like tired, but we can like deal with it because we kind of gotten into this like specific routine that we do but no i uh it was just it was just tiring but it just felt like one of those things where it's like i mean i was off work for basically for all intents and purposes for like two weeks it felt like i was off work for like a month and a half i mean it was just (laughs) uh you know so much going on and just trying to get into the swing of things but anyways yes i'm happy to be back on the podcast i have my one of my it's a girl cigars Uh, Uh, it's girls Uh uh-huh here we go nice it's just cheap. So bad. It seems to be falling apart a bit. I like that sound. It's picking up nicely on the uh, on the mic there. Um, I'm not going to say who bought me the cheap cigars, but <laughs> I appreciate it regardless. It was very nice. Giving off a very uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger vibe over here. Aha, uh-huh, yeah. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> Give me some lines from Last Action Hero. <laughs> Uh, the last action hero of all the movies that you could pick. He smokes a cigar actively in yeah, two films, and I was not going to mention the other, which is Batman and Robin. <laughs> no, he smokes a cigar in Predator. He gets oh, off of the... Oh, that's right. He's, he's got the... When he gets got off the lit, chopper yeah. at the very beginning, he's smoking, <laughs> he's smoking a big the, cigar. The little, like, I think he smokes cigar. A, I think he smokes a cigar in Commando, too, but that's just me. I can't remember if he does. I don't think he does in Commando, because he's got a daughter. Well, so he's like, the, he's like... Uh, he's got a, I think he's got a cigar in his mouth on the cover of the Commando. <laughs> yes, he probably does. <laughs> that was in his contract. <laughs> was, okay, I'm going to put this out because it's not that great. Uh, anyways, well, well, we're happy again. Thanks again for, for of course, chilling out with us. <laughs> of this course, is amazing. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, you can find us, you know, lastbuyingprod.com, all that other special stuff. Nobody really cares about me having kids. I don't think... Uh, I care about you having... I mean, it's... It, like, has it... All right, so 
Uh, well, this might be for another podcast at some point, but, um, like, what have you thought about as far as your daughter's film education? Like, what do you want their first, like, what movie do you want them to have the first memory of seeing? You know, it's tough. I really haven't thought about it that much. Because, like, you and Beth, I mean, are fairly, I mean, you're obviously, like, a huge film fan, but Beth is a yeah, fairly she's, first she's a film relative fan as well. Cinephile, yeah, and, I mean, she's very specific in what she likes with movies. I think almost she might have a more definitive opinion about something like that than I would. Um, I mean, because with me, it was more saturation. Like, I just watched as many movies as I could, where I think Beth is probably going to be more specific about, like, what she wants the girls to watch. Um, The Sandlot. (laughs) Right, The Sandlot, The Goonies, lots of the kid movies that start with a V. Uh, But no, it's, yeah, I I think that she's probably a little bit more... Exciting movies, you know, those, you know, showing the girls different movies and that sort of thing. But, like, I said, I'm happy when they want to watch any movies, you know, any, anything that they want to watch. What cool. if they, like, just want to watch the Kardashians? That would be... Well, <laughs> there are certain things that may not be allowed. Not in allowed house. in the house. Not in this house. Like, okay, not it's fine if you don't want to watch the movie, but you have to watch Georgia Bulldogs football <laughs> instead of the movie. <laughs> so, here, here, honey, I'm going to put on the 1980 National Championship tape. You watch that. And lieu of your... <laughs> Speaking of Georgia Bulldogs, did you see the clip online with uh, Bill Goldberg uh, doing the uh, the? I forgot what he, he used to have like a name for like his bull rush or whatever. Uh, I, I can't remember, oh, but right. doing it to uh, to the catcher from the Marlins no. in the stadium. It's pretty amazing. Nice. I meant to send that to you, but uh, yeah, Bill Goldberg, University of Georgia alum. Yeah, one of our finest Jewish athletes. Interesting. There, I mean, there aren't a lot. So he's on the list, I would say. The short list. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anyways, well, we, we have no real uh, seg this week. We just kind of want to talk about... Uh, it, it's also it's not a great topic for me as like a return thing or anything along those lines, but I don't know. We, we were we're going to come up with some other ideas, I think, with uh, the podcast that are coming up the next couple of weeks. We want to have Braden back in again. We want to have uh, do another podcast eventually. Uh, maybe in the next uh, four to eight uh, casts that we do. But anyways, uh, one thing that I thought was kind of interesting just because I was kind of thinking about my education, my self-education as film, before I got to film school, before I decided I even wanted to be involved or I wanted to learn anything about filmmaking, the things that were big kind of steps for me, because we've talked about like things that were like you know essential to us as growing as kids, like things that we were nerdy about, things or whatever. Um, and one thing that I thought about was the fact that um, foreign film actually played a pretty crucial role in my development in liking film. And I th- Matt's progression in, into your enthusiasm, I mean, like your enthusiasm in film was came along a little bit later than mine, I think. Yeah. I mean, at least to the level of like the, the like the yeah, getting of, like, into the geekdom. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I was always like a, I always loved movies. Uh, in like a pop culture sense but I didn't really get into like the making of that kind of stuff was really like in the 2000s which is interesting because I I have a similar we'll obviously get into it in detail but I have a similar like when I got really into film I went through like a rash of like foreign films that I I went through and I decided like that I could handle watching a foreign film and not be bored or not be worried that I was reading or the, the usual things that keep the General film populace. going yeah. public at large away from a foreign film. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Uh, and before I do anything, do you mind handing me a, uh, a 60 minute? I do not. All right. Go, today's podcast is brought to you by Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and Dogfish 60 in it. 60 in it? <laughs> 60 in it. It's a 60 in it. Um, because the thing is, is I, I felt like my, my mother uh, and stepfather especially were very uh, – they were very artistic people and they – or they – I wouldn't say they were very artistic people, but they had artistic sensibilities. They had a very uh, – a group of friends that was very artistically inclined and they, they found themselves, I think, gravitating to that crowd – it's like that. What, what were the hipsters in like the late eighties? You know, I'm, I'm, just like pseudo intellectual, basically. Yeah, like, yuppie. Uh, <laughs> no, not even yuppie because they weren't really yuppie. I mean, they were more hippie than yuppie. But it was like they they liked to watch these. They watch a lot of foreign films mm-hmm. and buy 
uh, by that measure, I ended up watching a lot of foreign films. And so uh, the first thing I wanted to, like, I kind of wanted to ask you, like, what do you, what is the first foreign film that you remember watching, like, from beginning to end? It was really difficult. Like, when I was trying to put together this list, I, and I, I typically, I, I wouldn't call it cheating, but when I'm putting together my lists, I'll often, like, go to other lists and, like, just take a look and be like, oh, yeah, that's something I, because I have a terrible memory, so it's hard for me to, to slot in, unless they're, like, the big cultural moments. And I couldn't really think of what my first one was, except the, the, the one that popped into my head. And I'm sure I've seen more before that. My mom, I'm sure, tried to make me watch something that I probably just didn't pay attention to. But the first one was um, Lake Water for Chocolate in our Spanish class. We watched it in Spanish. at Para Agua, blah, 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 whatever the hell it was. Um, and we watched that, and I think I watched Eat, Drink, Man, Woman as well. were like two Spanish films I watched in our Spanish class that I were the first time that like, it's one of those, I don't know if you had the same experience, but there were often times in school, um, in high school, especially and a little bit in college when I had a few, like I had a brief film classes, like one or two where like a movie was put on that I really didn't want to watch. And I was like, oh, sure. ah, like, I don't, I don't want to see this run. And you get caught up because they're usually a classic. That's how I came to Lawrence of Arabia. It was in a film uh, class in college and I was sure. like Ugh, I don't want to watch this like three and a half hour epic and then an hour and a half of the class has gone by and we get to intermission and the class is over I'm like I want to what we can't stop I've got to watch the rest of sure. this and that happened with those two movies um, you know they're foreign films I'm like oh, this is this is work this is cool but you get caught up in it if there are, if it's a good film like any film you become engaged in the story that's interesting, actually, because I had that exact same experience. And this was in a period of time where I liked foreign films, but I was uh, had a world studies class where we watched a lot of, uh, you know, interesting stuff. But at the last, we had block scheduling, so it was like we had these long periods. And over the course of a, like two weeks, we watched the entire Decalogue, uh, Krzysztof Kieslowski's Decalogue, which oh, wow. is it's basically ten films that are all like fifty minutes apiece. So we would watch two a period. I was like, we were, they told us we were doing this, and we were like, oh, my God, this is just going to be like pulling teeth. And I didn't even realize who had done it, Kieslowski, because I had earlier in my life already been introduced to his work. I had just had no interest. I had no idea. I was like, oh, it's a Polish thing. It's ten short films or short films, like 45 minutes apiece, based yeah. on the Ten Commandments. Yeah. And it ended up being like one of the most incredible like you know, miniseries achievements of all time. I think still it's one of the templates for all successful miniseries that have, you know gone through on a lot of the major networks like HBO. But I still remember the first time I ever saw a foreign film was uh, it just it was when it just came on video and I was six or seven years old and it was Au Revoir les Enfants, which is Louis Malle's uh, one of his last four films. I mean it's considered a masterpiece. I think it opened the Cannes Film Festival that year. It was. It's considered a masterpiece, a French masterpiece. Yeah. But the funny thing is, is like I look back over like my my history in film, and I feel like it's so funny because it's so partitioned into like the countries. Because I feel like I saw Au Revoir les Enfants. I don't <laughs> think I saw a foreign film other than a French film for like five years. <laughs> like I, it wasn't until I was twelve or thirteen years old, and I know exactly what the film was that broke me from that from that mold. But as soon as I got broken from the French film mold, I like moved to another type of film. Like I, then I moved to German film, yeah. And then I moved to me, uh, Italian or uh, excuse me, uh, Spanish and Mexican film. And then I moved to Italian film, and it was like really weird. It kind of makes the, sense. I mean, I and I had mine was similar. Like well, mine was weird, I, and I had two. And this always what is what makes these kind of interesting discussions when we have them is. Um, you know, defining what, you know, how do you define a foreign film? There are foreign films that are in English, in the English language, they're still considered foreign films. And there were two that I had when I was in high school as well. And it was when I used to try to hunt down, this is, and ages me, but like in, in like 95, 96, um, those years when I was like a, a frequent blockbuster visitor. And this is kind of, you know, pretty much pre internet. It's very difficult to find like film catalogs and get a hold of movies that you're trying to track down. And I was on this big kick of finding any movie of a book I'd read, even if it was obscure. And there were two that I believe are considered foreign films. One is Fahrenheit 451, which I believe is Italian, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. um, and the other was 1984, which is a British version with John Hurt, um, that I believe also is a foreign film as yeah. well. 
So those were kind of two other ones that I like. That's when I was on the book hunting front. Well, well one thing I, I wanted to specifically kind of mention is I don't consider films from England or like English or Australian imports to me or, or Canadian imports for that matter aren't foreign films to me. Just I, I, what I meant by foreign films and I, like those are foreign films technically, yeah. but I meant something that exists in a language that's not you know okay. the language you, you're. Because there's something that's so much different about adopt or, or accepting the fact that you're going to be listening to a performance in a different language and reading, what, yeah, you know, or, or something that's kind of encapsulating that performance at the bottom of the screen. I feel like, uh, even though I mean, because we could probably do an entire podcast on just English films. Yeah, and absolutely. Watch. That's and I, I on my list, I put British films with a question mark and then like right, a list exactly. behind so, it. So, so, so yeah, I, I don't really consider that. What I meant is more of the what you would traditionally consider your foreign film, the one yeah. that you would see with the uh, a subtitle or, or something along those lines. So, yeah. Well, anyways, it was funny because I don't know if anybody has seen or if Farley's on It's a great film that came out in like eighty seven and eighty eight. Uh, and it's it's a very beautiful, very poignant movie. I was probably a little too young to watch it and appreciate it for what it was. However, I was very compelled by it as a seven year old. Um, I was very I cried. I think I remember I cried at the at a point in the movie. Uh, I mean, cause it, it revolves around young boys. It revolves yeah. around boys who are in this this school uh, that's run by nuns uh, in Nazi Germany, and of course the main issue is one of the kids who has been admitted there as Jewish and they are hiding that specific fact. So uh, beyond that, I mean, the funny thing is, is so I remember going through all of these French films, like uh, Kislowski, who I mentioned earlier, I went through his uh, Trois Colors, the three colors. Yeah. He did red, white, and blue. Um, not in that order, blue, it went blue, red, white. But I remember seeing those at a young age, at 10, and that was something I really couldn't – I thought that they were slow at the time. However, I still found them visually comp compelling. I, yeah. liked the, I liked the images in them, uh, so it wasn't like pulling teeth. But those were films I really couldn't appreciate until I got a lot older. But I, I was watching all of this like high art, like all of these, these fantastic French directors, even going back into some of the Renaissance stuff of the, the 60s and sort of the French New Wave – with Godard and uh, other other things, I was watching Breathless, mm -hmm. just because for some reason I got it was like the only thing that existed to me was French film, like that was foreign <laughs> film, was French film, and nothing existed outside of that. You're just you're just much more cultured at a young age. My my introduction to uh, the the blue, red, and white trilogy, as well as Hamon Hamon, and uh, there's one other in the list I can't remember it. Um, all completely due to the fact that I knew they had nudity in them. I like had of looked course. through my, my film guides, and there were these movies, a rap blockbuster, that were acceptable to rent that didn't look like you were renting porn, but they were totally porn. You're like Juliette Binoche naked. Oh, Juliette yes. Binoche naked. Yes, let's watch this. Penelope Cruz naked in Hamon Hamon with a young, I believe, uh, Javier Bardem uh, is in that as well. Young Penelope Cruz. Yeah. Young Penelope Cruz and young Javier. Uh, very, very lovely to look at nude. Um, and so I would rent these movies with the express purpose of going to the nudie, and then I wound up watching all of them. Um, like, because I was like, well, all of this, I feel a little bit dirty. Or I'd get, like, I'd be going to a scene, and I'd see the scene, you but then I like, get caught up like, in... <laughs> you're like, you would just be like, okay, well, I, I'm really going to rub one out to this, but I'm going to wait, I'm going to watch the whole movie, and I will rewind. I will have the decency to rewind. Re reverse and, of that. It was, replay. yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it, get, get the job done, and, and then, then watch the film. And then be like, well, I'm going to stick around for the story. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Get, get my feet wet, so to speak. Uh, anyways, <laughs> that's funny. Um, I still remember the uh, the film that kind of broke at least the French barrier for me it was in 1994, uh, right when I was actually in Germany. Oh, by the way, that, that was the uh, the sprinklers just cutting. Off. I have been peeing so, so now, this entire podcast. Now it sounds like we're going to be attacked by cicadas <laughs> or by various outdoor. We're, we are on my back porch. This is the first time we've done this out here, but uh, a, old man on the that, back it's, porch. It's actually it's not bad. It's no. It's, this is a nice little nice little vibe out here. We got our little beer 
cooler and uh, and you know just, yeah, just hanging out. Sweet. Two gentlemen out in the back porch having a beer in the hot summer. Just like heat. during football season, I can turn on the TV and put it on mute. I mean, there we you got, go. Like, there we go. On. It's pretty good deal. Um. Anyways, what I was saying is I was in Germany in the summer of 1994, and I think it was right before I left, I was writing one of the kids who was in Germany, and we were talking about movies, and he was like, oh, have you seen Das Boot? You know, the 1984 Wolfgang Peterson <clears throat> German U-boat film, which is still the best submarine movie ever made. Uh, the, the director's cut's over four hours long, and it's the only time I'll ever say that a movie that's over four hours long needs to have nothing cut. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I listen, I'm like a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Return of the King could have they could have cut a bunch of shit. There are tons of movies I love, like even Apocalypse Now Redux. Apocalypse Now is in my top five movies of all time. The Redux, I still actually like the theatrical cut better. The Das Boot director's cut is the definitive version of yeah. that film. And it's not never boring. It's like awesome. It's four hours of like awesomeness. So I remember seeing that, and this is this is just the theatrical cut I saw, which I think is a little less than three hours or two and a half hours. And was like, this movie is so awesome. I made all my friends watch it. Actually, like I was like, oh, come over, and they're like, wow, this movie has subtitles. Uh, like I wasn't brave enough to show them like subtitles, like, Mavion Rose <laughs> or you know Le- Au Revoir Les Enfants or like any of the Trois uh, Couleurs, but I was happy enough to because I was like, there's action in uh, a submarine movie and it's a submarine <laughs> movie, so it's cool. I was like, I invited friends over and they were like, and it's fitting that it has subtitles, sure, because yes. it's a submarine movie. Yeah. That's right. Also, it also produces um, maybe the only highbrow joke in the entire movie, but probably my favorite joke is in uh, uh, Jurgen Prochnow is in uh, Beer Fest, and there's the bit where right. he's going over and he's like he's on a submarine and like he gets really weird at one moment. Like, what's wrong? He's like, I had a bad experience on one of these yeah. ones, and I'm like, yes, that is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is, it is pretty. Uh, that is a inside joke in a pretty lowbrow movie for yeah. sure. <laughs> Uh, but no, I, I love Das Boot a lot, and uh, I, I very promptly, I think it was the second uh, DVD I ever owned, actually. The first DVD oh. was The Matrix when I got my first new sound system. But I still remember, uh, this is older in high school, when I got the DVD player, the coolest thing that we ever thought was, was with one button you could switch between languages. <laughs> so we were switching between English overdubbing, yeah, the actual German trap, uh, a track and then uh, Spanish, where she's like, Andale, Andale, Torpedo, Torpedo. <laughs> so we kept on like, switching in between them, and we thought it was the funniest thing ever when we were in high school. But uh, but Das Boot was one, like, I don't know. Uh, you know, I feel like maybe we didn't explain this podcast very well, but I, like I said, we're not talking about foreign film in general. I was just talking about the way it relates to what how, the way that we watch films. And okay. Yeah, you, you kept like, you kept giving me. Uh, like further parameters and I didn't really understand so I'm just like I'm screw it I'm making a list of foreign films that I like that's and fine that's fine I mean uh, I mean all, it makes sense a, I have a progression a, I have a storyline no, right, right, to go with right, it right, right exactly I mean that, that's the thing because I'm not I'm not going to talk about because ever since I started thinking and learning about film later in life uh, th- there were films that I was just like wow that's you know really incredible or whatever but they didn't have anything to do with me growing as like a filmmaker or as a as a cinephile. Yeah, I'll, I'll say yeah. I mean, and I, I kind of tried to make that on my list, and I have some okay. like high like I mean, I saw a Crouching Tiger and Hidden, Dra- Hidden Dragon in the movie theater, and I oh, thought I mean, it was beautiful. I saw it four so, times. In the movie yeah, like, I like that. I and and I saw Hero, you know, because of Crouching T- Tiger, I kind of sought out Hero and watched that. But the ones that actually impacted me the most were. The Chan Wook Park uh, movies that I, I, I watched, I didn't watch old. I watched Old Boy first um, on a recommendation. I had a friend that, that was like, "Oh, you've got to watch these movies." For, well, first he gave me Takashi. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's Mike or Mike or how it's pronounced. The guy that did Audition and scared the crap out of me, which is a Japanese film. And they said, "Well, there's actually like these this Korean filmmaker that's got these really amazing movies." And Old Boy had gotten some, you know some steam behind it and a lot of like the geek sites were talking about it. you gotta see this movie it's got this you know it's a really amazing thing so I watched Old Boy and I was like wow this is amazing and then of course I went like like I tend to do when I watch watch or read something of a series that I like I go 
I dive into it. Like that's I'm just I shut everything else out. So I watched for like a month nothing but his other movies. I watched Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance and sure. uh and Joint Security Area, which is still the most underrated bar none of his movies, I think is fantastic. Um and I forget the the other one is uh that I watch. I, and I, I never actually finished. There's the trilogy, the Sympathy Trilogy. There's Sympathy for Mrs. Vengeance, which I haven't seen. Or Sympathy for Lady Vengeance, I think it, it's called. Um, but yeah, there's another one in his, in his repertoire that I don't know, but I was like, I was fascinated by this Korean cinema and I started to like look at other Korean filmmakers and that's kind of like I latched on to one subgenre and started looking at like just Korean filmmakers and watching these movies and they were it was fascinating to me. It was the first time like I sat and watched these. Have you ever seen Time and Tide? That's a Korean filmmaker. I don't think so. That's interesting. Well, I was going to bring that up at some point. It's well, one, one of my favorite Korean movies ever made. Well, for me, what what changed everything for me actually was Netflix. Um, you know, sure. that's when I first those movies were readily available. It was very easy to get Old Boy. I just I put it in my queue and it popped up and came to my house. Netflix was like a really, I mean. I mean, I guess a lot of people do accept that it's, you know, it's a pretty, like, big movement. But Netflix, like, was a game, absolutely a game changer for sure. how I watched and digested movies and the, and the access I had to them. You know, now I just use the, the, the queue and I can download, I can find movies other places. But back then it was like, there was this whole library of films that you couldn't get at Blockbuster. And you couldn't, you know, or you, you'd have to, like special order or go drive to hell and back to find and all of a sudden they'd be delivered right to my door and i like i'd rent i i purposely moved myself to the five movie plan because i would get so invested in watching like like the child Park parks up i got like all five that were on netflix that he had so i could watch them all in one day and like just go like delve into a really dark <laughs> dark set of films but it's fun yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, obviously, like, my sort of progression was, like, of course, a little bit younger. So most of the stuff that I actually was, uh, you know, I encountered or, or was, you know, uh, I was actually exposed to at that age is you had a lot more options. You probably saw a lot more stuff that was probably more obscure or a little bit cooler or things that, that – because uh, you also had the web to, like, generate, you know, buzz about certain movies. And things yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. This uh, is true. So I, I think that uh, in one way I, I felt like at, at a young age I was watching a lot of stuff kind of blind. Obviously huge movies like Over the Wallace Enfant had this, this huge, you know, impact. But I kind of say that because I'm going to seg later into sort of the, the films that I sort of retroactively, as even before I went to film school, that I kind of revisited. Obviously, I, like I was talking about the French film, uh, and, and then I moved to German film. And then, of course, beyond Das Boot, I was wa- there were a few other German films I really liked. I was still watching French films like La Haine, which came out in 1996, and I, I, I really liked a lot of movies that came out. But then I, th- I feel like the one thing, or at least the moment that, I, like, I liked foreign films, and I knew that no, none of my friends liked foreign films. You know, like, I, I, I felt like I could appreciate them and understand them. I, of course, I was like this, I was probably a little bit, I, I was trying to act like a, <laughs> I was trying to act like a douchebag, hyper-intellectual, you know, 14 or 15-year-old yeah. who was watching these. I mean, my favorite movie was The, Gra- the Graduate, and I was, you know, uh, I was probably a hipster before hipster should have been, you know, a thing. (laughs) But in 1998... You were a hipster before they were uncool. uh, (laughs) Exactly. Uh, But in 1998, when uh, Lola Renta or Run Lola Run came out, I felt like that was the moment to me that I realized that foreign films were literally the exact same, could be the exact same thing as Hollywood films and even better yeah. except they were in another language. I mean, like I never really made that. Like I always felt like they had to be artistic. They had to be some, there had to be a, something that was kind of reaching for something different than what Hollywood was doing at the time. Yeah. Which Run Little Run does, but the presentation was so much more uh, like, uh, there was so much more going on in that movie. I remember that they were talking about the ridiculous amount of cuts that are in that movie. Yeah. Uh, and it, I was just like, wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. Uh, I, I, I remember watching that movie just being blown away. And I was like, wow, I really need to focus more on foreign film and the films that have come out 
that are doing things that Hollywood does but better, basically. Yeah. Because at that point, I was like, this movie is is more interesting, better than this stuff. It, it was a thriller that had less going on plot-wise than most of the thrillers Hollywood was producing, but was ten times more connect, kinetic. Well, yeah, and it, and what and like and that's a really interesting movie to look at. And it's funny, like you talk about friends not watching it. I got I got kind of lucky, even though none of my friends, other than maybe a little bit of Howard, but he he wasn't really like a, a major cinephile. Most of my friends were kind of casual filmgoers, but they were also like kind of on the higher hyper educated side. So Run Little Run was like a big movie around our apartment. Um, sure. You know, discussion of this movie that was like, oh, have you seen this? It's really good. Um, and and we kind of. That was right around the explosion, I think, of, like, highly popular foreign films in America. And, you know, you look at movies like that that sort of paved the way. Well, I mean, you have Crouching Tiger was, like, a really huge... That was 2000. Yeah, that was, like, the, the first time in a long time that there was this... Uh, one of the blockbusters that was out well, was remember, this foreign it was, film. Well, the, there were two films that really did a lot for that. There was... Crashing Tiger, Hidden Dragon, there was Life is Beautiful, both mm-hmm. of which were foreign films, and both of which were nominated for Best Picture. So were they they were a year apart. They were one year apart, exactly. But they, they were they were in consecutive years. Yeah. That foreign film, a foreign film was was nominated for Best Picture of the Academy Awards. Yeah, which was kind of a big deal, you know. Very much, and well, and they paved the way. I mean, you'll, you'll get into them, I'm sure, kind of how your progression, but. For me, they, they were the ones that kind of paved the way for things like E2 Mama Tambien. Like, then you, you oh, started exactly. to get this rash of, I mean, especially the me- Mexican cinema, and you look at, at somebody like uh, Cuaron, um, Cuaron Del and Toro. Del Toro, um, really, they, I think they're, like, I, I, Crouching Tiger was close, because that was kind of like a beautiful action movie type thing, but what I think was fascinating about what, um, what Del Toro and Cuaron did I don't know if you want to like wait to get into that, but for me, they they were making even though they were beautiful and artistic, they were still poppy. You know, like they felt like they felt like a great American film. You know, you you had some of the same beats. You had a feel that didn't feel like an art house. Here are the funny things about that, and it's kind of an interesting thing that you mentioned that that they feel they felt American, but they I mean in the poppy sort of way, but they were foreign films. Uh, and I'll get to Del Toro and Cuaron more explicitly in a second, but both of them were directors that had done American film. Yeah. They had done Hollywood film. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that they already had that in their repertoire. So uh, they they weren't unseasoned veterans. Cuaron like did Little Princess first and Great Expectations. And Great Expectations. Yeah. Cuaron did that. And uh, Del Toro had done Mimic yeah. was, his, was his English language film. But... I mean, I'm just saying they had done Hollywood yeah, yeah. Hollywood films. So, I, one way it was kind of interesting because I was going to get there a little bit. The thing that kind of after One Little Run came and I had been – because I had been watching almost exclusively European films at this point. I had been watching the French films. I had then gone into the German films, some of those. And then uh, by uh, virtue of that, some of the Polish films that Kieslowski did, even Swedish films. And then I saw Insomnia when it came out in 1998 and I was getting into a lot of this stuff. But really, Run Little Run was the one where I was like, if they can do this sort of stuff, what else is out there that is cooler mm-hmm. in American cinema? And by virtue of Run Little Run, which was a German film directed by a half German director and Tom Tickver, Tyker, yeah, Tyker. Uh, however, his last name is pronounced. <laughs> I mean, I lo- he's one of my favorite directors. Uh, he. I actually, by virtue of that, found Hong Kong cinema. Yeah. Which, Hong Kong cinema, I mean, I'm not talking about, if you're talking about the Kung Fu movement, which I'm not really into Kung Fu films. Yeah. And I don't think Matt is either. We're, uh, some of it's great, some of it's really cool. There's lots of interesting stuff in there. When the hyper-stylized violence came of the late 80s and early 90s, when gunplay was introduced, when it became less about martial arts and more about uh, it was basically sort of a stylized film noir, the things that they were doing in the 40s and 50s, and then implementing it in a modern context with weapons and with... Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was noir. It was modern noir. Uh, explicitly the stuff that John Woo was doing with, like, The Killer. Hard, the, I, hard-boiled. 
And then also things like Time and Tide, which was a, a Hong Kong – Hong Kong – I was talking about earlier. It was a Hong Kong-based film, but it was done by a Korean filmmaker. I forget the name of the guy. But the I was watching these films, and I was just like, these guys are just – kicking ass mm. I mean it was better than any American action films I had seen ever because we didn't have well it's because they're they were artistic they made action artistic and really uh, you know and and, and, it, and the US is kind of coming back around full circle again to where we're in the 80s and I listen I loved Commando as a kid I loved Predator and I loved you know I wasn't a big Rambo guy but I liked like the big ridiculous action movies but that's really all there was. There was like the there. You occasionally got stuff like Lethal Weapon and some of those ones that we talked about in our our kind of buddy movie podcast and stuff. But you didn't have artistic action in the U.S. Like you didn't have highbrow action, which is especially for and that might be just a male thing. But for a guy, that's like a that's like getting in touch with both of your sides at the same time, and it's exciting to watch those. Oh yeah, and you're like this is beautiful, and they're kicking ass. It's like the best of both worlds. No, I completely agree. And, and and so it was definitely something that I was I had never seen before at that point in my life. I, and I really had a, a big infatuation with that for like a summer. Like I think I watched all of like the Wu films. I watched a lot of the other really highly thought of uh, of uh, you know Hong Kong films, basically the, those action with a, the big action set pieces and that sort of stuff. And I, I loved that stuff. You know, for a, a time, it still has its place in my heart. But uh, I mean, I, I still feel like. And the funny thing is, is, so then Hollywood started copying and aping that yeah. for about five to ten years, and eventually, just kind of that type of filmmaking almost kind of just died. Yeah. Uh, I mean, from from about I think 1997 when Face Off came out to 2007, because Face Off was successful. It was a John Woo film that that was. Hollywoodizing even further what they were doing in Hong yeah. Kong, they kept on trying to do like replacement killers and all, all these mm-hmm. other high budget films, and then things starring Jet Li, and it, it, none of it really worked. The only uh, one that I thought it. worked really well was uh, the Long Kiss Goodnight. Well, Long Kiss Goodnight, what? Well, I mean, that's Shane Black and Randy yeah. Marlin. Yeah. Which is not. I mean, it, it takes some of those memes, if you could call them that, from the. From that genre and utilizes them really well. I mean, maybe Rennie Harlan was a fan of, of some of those films, but to me, Longest Good Night just feels like a inventive Die Hard the, sequel. Yeah, I don't know. I always found something more in that movie. I don't know. It was just maybe it was one of those I saw and sort of idealized at the time. I don't know. It's a great no. It's a, it's a great movie. It's not a foreign film. Though. I know it's not a foreign. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just fucking with you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have another beer? Yeah, you may. Which you uh, want? Oh, they're the same. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, get that. <laughs> open it for me, Matt. I'll open it. Open your beer. Anyways, uh, I don't want to, you know, pontificate for too long. I was basically just kind of. The, the, the funny thing was, is then. After I had seen all these films, and it was almost right at the time where I was accepted to film school and actually was able to go to film school, that I began – it was actually – I still remember it was my freshman year of I, – I remember my friends had told me, one of my friends, few friends in high school who had, was a big foreign film fan and loved – he was two years younger than me. Daniel Pickett. No. <laughs> it's Doug Message actually. The, the proto, uh, he was in the Proto Men, the drummer for the Proto Men. Oh, okay. But he uh, he was two years younger than me and was a huge fan of foreign film. And we watched a lot of movies together. We watched a lot of, of obscure foreign films together. And uh, he told me about City of Lost Children. He was like, this movie is so weird and so fucking cool. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. I And he was like, it's this, he was like oh, they, they did this other movie and I – Still remember, I watched it. Like I watched half of the movie with him. I was like, "This is really cool." I really want to catch this, but I had to leave or go do something. I got to film school, and I didn't take any film classes my first, you know, two semesters. I was getting all my liberal arts stuff done, but I had access to the film school library. I was like, "Oh, I remember City of Lost Children." I really want to watch that again. And I popped that in, and I was like, "Wow, this is a hugely incredible realized world." That I mean, this is just so incredibly inventive. Where did this come from? 
And then I got led to Delicatessen. I'm like, how did I miss this when I was like <laughs> obsessed with French film for, yeah. for that long? Or that's the only thing I was watching. And I'm assuming it was because my mother, I was young enough that my mother was, you know, protecting me from the stuff I was watching. Delicatessen was probably a little bit too much for me to, yeah. to process at nine or ten years old when it came out. But uh, my still one of my favorite working directors is Jean-Pierre Junet who directed Delicatessen City of Lost Children, and then later, of course, Amelie, which came out that year. Uh, of which 2001. was 2001, yeah. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, a very long engagement. The thing is, is he had also done Alien Resurrection, which is probably, it's hysterical, the first P- Jean-Pierre Junet film I saw was Alien Resurrection. <laughs> and he's one of my favorite working directors. <laughs> he made it past that. He, that made, he made it through that, and... <laughs> And I watched that movie recently. It's just, it's a fucking train wreck. But, I mean, it's a beautiful train wreck at some point, and there's some great lines. Joss Whedon, written. Yeah, like, that, uh, like that's like, the written, written by Joss thing Whedon. Directed by, by Jean Pierre Genet. Like, two of the coolest guys. And that'll, that movie. I'll show the you what a studio can do. Biggest <laughs> fucking piece of shit. It's, uh, it's just so, it's so awful. But, anyways, uh,. Yeah, the, it, there were two things I discovered, right, really there early in film school. One was uh, Jean-Pierre Junet and sort of the, the subculture of the, the new French movement there in the 90s. And then also was what we were talking about, Quaron and Del Toro. Mm-hmm. Because in 2001 was the year that Itamama Tambien came out. It was released at festivals that year. I saw it at a festival, at Fort Lauderdale Film Festival, in October of 2001. And Devil's Backbone came out in August of 2001. I saw both of those movies that fall. And those are still probably, I mean, Ito Mama Tom Yen, top 20 of my, all, of my favorite films of all time. Devil's Backbone, top five horror films I've ever seen in my entire life. And they were both foreign <clears throat> films subtitled, and I, I, they're both incredible. Do you put Devil's Backbone above uh, Pan's Labyrinth? Yes. Hmm. I like Pan's. Pan's, for some reason, speaks Pan's Labyrinth is a fantasy movie to me, though. Yeah. And it's a horror film. Yeah. And even though the thing is, is... What I love about Devil's Backbone, and he's done it, he did the exact same thing in Pan's Labyrinth, and I hate to be the guy who says, well, he's already done it once, so maybe it lessens its effect the second time. Is that who is the bad guy in Pan's Labyrinth? It's General yeah, yeah, What's-His-Face. Yeah. The same thing happens in Devil's Backbone. You're, this is a ghost, a gothic ghost story with very scary moments. Mm-hmm. The bad guy is this sociopathic, dude who wants to basically kill all the kids yeah yeah so the the thing i loved about watching that movie back in 2001 i was like this is a ghost movie where the ghosts i mean it wasn't like the others yeah yeah, yeah. Where, where the you realize at the end that these the ghosts aren't bad people it's basically just kind of this mis- miscommunication yeah. you know and the uh the different planes of reality it's more along the lines of, and it's something that I think that was rel- like very slowly or slightly touched on by Peter Jackson in The Frighteners, is that humans have the ability to be more frightening than ghosts. Yes. In the context of the same story. So, Which is something, I, I, it's so weird, and I apologize, this is a slight tangent. No, it's fine. I, I, uh, I, I didn't make it all the way through. I started watching The Conjuring uh, uh, like a couple weekends ago. I found a found a bootleg of it, and I started watching it. It was it was cool. I liked the the styling of it. I didn't really get to where I imagined things go like crazy batshit in it. But I was watching again, and I was thinking about the others and thinking. And I'm like, th- it's a great storyline, like what you're talking about right there, with the idea of humans versus ghosts, but telling it as the humans as as the ghosts, you know, as the the villains in it. And I don't think i was like there are movies that get close but no one ever quite hits what i want to see in a movie like that like i i don't know why like if it's just something i don't know what it is specifically i'm looking for but it's something it's a fascinating idea to me that i just never it never is done to my satisfaction because well, I, yeah, I remember right around the same time that that devil's backbone came out or right before it came out was what lies beneath which is mm-hmm. one of those things where they were essentially doing the same thing. They play the ghost for scares. Yeah. And the bad guy ends up being a much more human entity. Unfortunately, What Lies Beneath had a lot more pitfalls. Mm. And, I mean, Devil's Backbone is a much more... And I love Zemeckis to death, but Devil's Backbone was a much more nuanced and much yeah. more creative film. And beautiful 
film. And I and I hate what lies beneath. See, I don't hate it. it. I, I, we have, we've talked about. I that, know. I, I actually like it. But, and I, I'm a huge Zemeckis fan. It's probably my least favorite, bar none, in his entire au, au, au But uh, interesting. Yeah. But I, no, I, I actually I, I don't hate the movie, but I I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, there, there are definitely. He's things. trying to do his Hitchcock. I just it's it, everything about it is just trying too hard. I don't know. Yeah. See, I mean, I can understand a lot of the pe- problems that people have with it, uh, but I. I you know, whatever. Anyways, I, yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying, though. It's, it's difficult to kind of. I think it's been difficult for any sort of filmmaker to encapsulate that sort of feeling of where the humans are more. I'm, um, you know, except in almost in a comedic context, like yes. what I was saying, or Casper, like, like where you have a good ghost versus right, bad, bad ghosts. Pe- or or good ghost versus bad people. You yeah, know? but it's in a comedic context, like in the Frighteners. You know? think it, and I'll say, and the weirdest one that actually gets closest to it, but it's still not really. That's not really the. The storyline is maybe Six Sense is kind of on that same wavelength as well. Right. It's similar, which is and theme. it's a little bit more and it's a little bit more vague in yeah. what the the uh, what the actions of these the spirits represent. Well, yeah. Plus, I mean, and I'll argue with just about anyone that wants to argue that Six Sense is a love story and not a horror movie. But that's that's my my take on it. I've always looked at it as a love story. A very romantic love story, actually. Same as my... Braveheart? <laughs> <laughs> Never. Uh, I'll concede six cents as long as you concede Braveheart. Along with me. Amelie being every man's favorite movie. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Well, uh, but th- that was sort of like... Because uh, I remember that was sort of the last thing before I got into studying film. And then, of course, I, I was a assistant professor for like Italian film. Have you ever seen Johnny Stacchino? I think... Uh, you tell me you have or haven't? I Johnny forgot. Stacchino. That was another uh, foreign film I saw right when I was about about to go into film school. That is, it's a R- Roberto Benigni. It's one of his films. It's from ninety one or ninety two. No, I don't think I've seen it. It's it's a physical comedy. It's basically like uh, really with Roberto. No way. Right, of course. <laughs> it's like, but, but it is one of those funny things. Obviously, he always plays the comedy of errors, the guy who's in the wrong place at the wrong time. But does that with like the the verve of a Jim Carrey slash like but divided by Woody Allen, it's hysteric. I mean, it's one it's of kind of how I describe I would describe him in general is Woody probably, Allen meets Jim Carrey. No, actually, you're probably right, but I mean, like with the filmmaking touch of huh. a Woody Allen. Interesting. It it's pretty brilliant. I mean, a lot a lot of the the framing and a lot of the way that a lot of the visual gags work out look like sort of like a Woody Allen movie. Interesting. It's like yeah, it's like, it's like State and Maine meets <laughs> Annie Hall. Do love State and Maine. Uh, anyways, but, but yeah, I mean, those were the things that those are the ones that I remember just very vividly from my, you know, I haven't, I haven't first time I haven't looked at my list uh, uh, until right now just to to see. I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, there there are a couple ones I want to I want to mention that yeah, I think good. were like kind of important and and some of these I'm mentioning specifically because I saw them in the theater which is somewhat rare that uh, that I'd, I'd see a foreign film in the theater but especially during like the mid 2000s when I was in my arty you know trying to gobble up as much mm-hmm. cinema which as I mean, could it, it was around that time where it was rare that I saw a movie that didn't have subtitles <laughs> in the theater. yeah um, one of the ones is, uh, have you ever seen The Triplets of Belleville? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Triplets I, of Belleville was like 06, I think. Yeah, yeah, like mid-2000s. Um, I saw that in the theater with my buddy Ken. Uh, and it was one of those, just, it absolutely, I thought it was gorgeous. Like, I, everything about it, I love the music. I, I love, the opening, I think, is amazing with all of the, like, oh, uh, yeah, like where it's all of the, um, like, pop culture references from that time period from, uh, uh, like uh, Josephine Baker, and you've got the guitar player um, it's a, from Sweet and Lowdown. Um, I can't remember his Django Reinhardt, right? Um, and some other ones. That was definitely on my list of like a movie I'm obsessed about and bought. I own that on DVD at home. Um, another one is uh, as far as the only the only Hong Kong cinema that really really grabbed me was. Uh, a, and I preferred it to to Shailen Sakura's Kung Fu Hustle, um, sure. which I thought was just Steven such, Chow. yeah, was just a it was a big batshit, just 
batshit crazy, but amazing. Like, it reminded me, it would, to me, it felt like this is what Buster Keaton would do if he had access to CGI and a budget and could just, like, make these out, these ridiculous gags right. and well, stuff. Well, Stephen Chow's MO, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, his kind of thing. Um, and then... Yeah, I have one that you you won't you will disqualify because it's in English, but I still consider it a foreign film, and I'll consider it even more so because it's quite a bit about foreign cinema. Is the Dreamers? Um, it, it's a, it's it's Ber- Bernardo Bertolucci. Yeah, it's it's a it's an American film. I think I feel yeah. like I still feel like it's it's a foreign film in its presentation, but it's yeah. That I mean that and that was a movie that really I saw that in the theater that like. Uh, it just floored me. Like, really, one of those movies that made me it made me want to watch more foreign cinema because it's about a kind of a love of. Well, the funny thing is, is I, the I one of the things I find really interesting about the Dreamers is Bertolucci's reverence for 1930s classic American cinema. Yeah, uh, and uh, like they have the whole uh, conversation between uh, and, uh, for, from the twenties between Chaplin and. Uh, and Buster Keaton, yeah, who, yeah, who's yeah. better? Who who is the better filmmaker, and who is uh, the one who had the, the the more talent? Essentially, the the films that are mentioned in that movie are the ones of the time, which yeah. are the Godard, Band Apart, and uh, many other uh, of the like I said, French New Wave. Which yeah. is, uh, but the reverence for classic film in that movie are far. I think feel like it even far outbalances the stuff that they were talking about that was coming out at the time. This is true. True. I almost think that the Dreamers is sort of a love letter to classic cinema in a in a weird sort of way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, very much so. Very much so. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, it's you know, for, foreign cinema is it's interesting in that way because um, I had a had a point that was going to pop up in my head. Oh, well, we have to. You definitely have to look at the fact of the the um, the impact of foreign cinema on American cinema with the idea of how many remakes are are coming out yearly based on foreign movies that, that the American filmmakers feel aren't, weren't ever going to get the audience as a foreign film, so we're going to repackage it. Some of them do it well. Some of them do it well, but but redundantly. You know, things like, I, I think both um, Let Me In and Girl with a Dragon Tattoo are... Didn't do anything new. Yeah, they're and they're. I throw Insomnia in there too. Yes, yeah. Except for the performances. Yeah, I think Insomnia feels it's the, it's the same, but the performances are definitely I think put it on different. a different level. Um, but the other two to me feel very similar in that they're just they they feel like the same movie, and they're not bad. They're not bad films. If both of those films existed without the one that they were based on, you'd say that was a really interesting. They're very competent. Competently made films, competent oh, sure. filmmakers, um, but they don't, they're not bringing anything to it. And there's almost this sigh of relief when you watch that, that they at least didn't destroy it. Like they didn't make the American version and it's just like a bastardization. And I keep waiting for that. The closest I think they've gotten to really putting the American stamp on it is the remake of Infernal Affairs with The Departed. I, I felt the Departed. So I think it's, Departed's a better movie than Infernal I, I, Affairs, and that's what I was going to say. Like, it's one of the few that really takes it takes that story and it takes the the majority of that plot and it puts it in another location. But what it does smartly is it makes that location pa- like a, a part of the movie. There's a, a there. Ba- the Boston is important to that movie. There's a reason to take that story to Boston and tell it in a new way. And I think that's a really important thing to look at with in how you make. A remake, right? Which is what I'm kind of hoping will happen with Spike Lee's Old Boy, but we'll we'll see. I don't really know if that one's. Yeah, we're gonna have to so. reserve judgment on that. I mean, I can't remember the last time. I mean, the last time I was really surprised by Spike Lee with a, a film that he made was Inside Man, just because it was very unlike Spy Lee, Spike Lee. It was, yeah, it, that movie didn't feel like a movie that was directed by him. Uh, then again, Spike Lee has also directed one of the few films I might say. I mean, one of the handful of films I might say I would never change a frame in that film, and that's to do the right thing. Mm-hmm. So, even though it's not something that would find its way into my top ten or top five, or even top twenty of all time, there's something just inherently perfect about that film as yeah. it exists. Uh, so, I I respect Spike Lee as a filmmaker very much, 
I, I still am just going to be like, well, let's wait and see on that one. I mean, we'll, we'll see how that works out, but... I don't care. I mean, the, the trailers have me... They piqued my interest. Just from... The, versus the... Like, I saw the trailer and I was like, okay, I'm very fascinated by Speaking what I'm of, seeing you here. You know, I, I forget the name. It's called the, like, something journey of... Uh, I forget what it is, but the... Uh, you know, like I said, I'm a big Junet fan. He, he's doing his first full English language film is coming out around awards time this mm-hmm. this season. And uh, it's the first English film that he's done since Alien Resurrection. That's interesting. It's fine. I, I'm, I'll have to look at that. that. That's the same as I keep meaning to watch the Chan Wook Park English film that Stoker. he did this year. Stoker, which I, I keep, I heard amazing things about. And I just haven't gotten around to watching, but do you watch it? I watched half of it. Oh, uh, you didn't... No, I'm interested. I need to finish it. Oh, uh, okay. It's very... Um, well, the funny thing is that his style in a lot of the stuff that he's done in the past is very precious and very self-referential. Uh, the images mean a lot. In this movie, he his performances are so self-referential and so self-aware. Mm-hmm. Uh, he doesn't rely on so much of a visual storytelling technique that it feels like a different person directing. Hmm. I, uh, I, I wasn't as drawn in by the visuals as I usually would be with his films. Well, that's it. I mean, and that's, it's kind of like, it's one of the reasons why I really, I, that's why I was like joint security area is that joint security area isn't really a sure. visual. It, it's like a play. It's, I mean, most of it takes place in this, like lack of a better word, a tree house, but it's this, like uh, like a, a hide that they're in up in up in the trees with these four guys playing cards, you know, essentially in this small cabin that's up in a tree, and that's pretty much most of the movie. There are a couple of artistic sure. shots yeah. oh, with yeah. with the size, but for the most part, it's the performances, and it's one of the few foreign films where I really I feel like I really feel the performances, and not that, and that's always the thing that's going to suffer a lot of times. In a foreign film, for me, at least on the first viewing, like I think foreign films to truly appreciate the performances, you have to you have to watch it, read it, get the story, get the plot out of the way, and then go back and really soak in the visuals and definitely the performances to see. And it's hard; it's difficult to know if someone. How do you know if someone gave a good line delivery? Like you don't know where in the line they are in a foreign language, especially in when you're looking at an Asian language versus. It's a little easier, maybe in Spanish or Latin based. Oh, languages. sure, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and sort of to wrap everything up, one of the things I was going to say: if you uh, want a nice introduction to just any sort of foreign cinema, watch David Wayne's movie The Ten, and watch <laughs> the one segment which uh, is uh, 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 what's her face, the blonde chick. Oh, uh, 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 I know who you're talking about. Um. um I'm blanking on the name as well. Uh, she played uh, the, like the porn star, or like the the nudie artist, or whatever. Um, so look, look this up as as Ben. Uh, uh, anyways, uh, but it's got it's got Justin Thoreau in it as Jesus playing Jesus, and they uh, they'll they, they're speaking in Spanish the entire time, but then occasionally the voiceover artist will come in and just start. You know, talking about what's happening. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, Vahina. <laughs> Vahina. Gretchen Mall. Gret- Gretchen Mall. Gretchen Mall. Gretchen Mall. <laughs> I never played. I totally did not know. Remember that Jason Sudeikis is in that movie. He's Very the guy who's like, You sewed up uh, a. Uh, <laughs> uh, you sewed up a pair of scissors in my wife? I did it as a goof. You goof? A goof? <laughs> no, no, no. As, as a goof. goof. <laughs> completely underappreciated comedy absolutely underappreciated comedy uh, i think we should just watch that for the next podcast we'll just I put it so. on to well us. let's I, do an mst 3k style commentary on the I, we we've actually had of the the few people i talked to mainly my co-workers who were on the podcast last week um we've talked definitely about that they, they are they think they would absolutely enjoy listening to one of the following Either us doing an MST 3K over a movie, but we have to let it be a fan submission. Like let people so the and and kind of one of those where we can't be prepared. Like we we say, all right, here are the top ten. We're gonna put them in a hat. We have them already queued up. 
going to pull it out. This is what we t- this is what we we watch and we discuss for the next hour and a half, two hours. The other, which is my push, and I think we are the two people to do it true justice, is to do our own drunk history. But instead of doing it with history, I think we should recount a movie plot and do our own drunk retelling I think of we a should, movie. I think we should do both of these. <laughs> I no, I think absolutely we should do both of these, and we will. Uh, We'll put those in, but I, I, I just, every I time I watch so, Drunk so History, the thing, there uh, are Ben moments. Like, there. like when we do the Drunk History, I think we should do it as like because honestly, the Drunk History things don't have to last for very long. It no. can be a short special episode where what we can do is we can do a Drunk History where I explain the plot of a movie and then you also explain the plot of a movie and we'll edit <laughs> separate, together. For, yeah, we'll separate from that and we'll add together as part of one, and we'll do some little intros and some fun stuff in there. And then the other one of the other ones we could do is where we we put on a movie and we talk about it. For you know a little bit, and and we might want to edit out part of the movie so we can actually just cut it down and make it manageable. We can but... fast forward, <laughs> like oh, this scene is stupid, and while we're fast forwarding, we just talk about whatever the hell we want. Yeah, exactly. Like, all right, we're fast forward for the part where this is where the boy loses girl and he like does a stupid thing for a half an hour, and it's only he doesn't need you don't need that. So yeah, I, I think those are, are those are both really good ideas. I, I, I enjoy and have both some of fun them. Stuff. I, I absolutely enjoy both of those. We'll, ideas. we'll try. We're, we're trying to mix in the fun with the serious. Is kind of definitely one of our more like intellectual uh, discussions, which I enjoy. I actually listen to these back through more often. than The other ones just because it's again this is part of my free film school. It really all it cost me was an eighty like, dollar uh, mic. Uh, I, and, and the, here's I, and I apologize in to, in one sense because I'm not trying to like <laughs> I, I, I I'm not talking about films. I mean because that's the thing I could talk about foreign films from like or or the the American impulse since the beginning of film like the most important ones. I, I didn't want to do that this time. I just want to talk about the ones that I liked. Yeah, like the ones that meant something. to no, me No, it's at good, the time. and I like I'm happy that we didn't get into deep discussions about. Uh, the Seventh Seal, or the Seven Samurai, or other or any like, of those seven movies, any of the seven foreign films, El Siete, uh, you know, whatever. Um, it's not like it's good. Like it's it, really it, funny though. I will say really quickly. Oh no! Is, no, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Is that there have been very, very famous and very, very well thought of uh, films, like especially foreign films in history that I've watched and have been like, I don't get it. Like, I mean, like, I understand why it was popular, but still, this isn't a good movie. And uh, one of those would be, like, like for example, everyone talks about Akira Kurosawa. It's like, Yojimbo. I'm like, it's funny. It's, like, hysterically funny. People take that movie way too seriously. Like, it's basically just a comedy. Yeah. Like, it's a comedy with a couple of these very serious moments that don't mean shit. I'm like, I'd rather watch Ron or one of those other... You know, epic movies that Kurosawa did. I just had an interesting idea for a podcast. Oh, what was that? Top five smartest comedies ever made. Oh, I like it. I, that just kind of pops. Smart, pop, the smart, smart. comedies. They ha- you have to back Man, up that these I would are. Spend, I would spend smart. five times as much time as we actually do doing the <laughs> podcast coming up with my list of five. Absolutely, but I think that's in, like that would I fascinate think, I, me. I, I think I would need like a quick thing of like runners up. Like these didn't make the list. <laughs> of course, of have. course. It, 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 be we'll just, it'll be like the uh, the SNL sketch with the Fox News where they run like the retractions at the end. <laughs> yeah. A list of all the other movies that we couldn't fit on there. But um, yeah, we're we're at okay. Excuse me. Ooh. Oh, you love having that demon come out of you. Oh, I love it. We, we are at 62 minutes and 6 seconds, which means it is time to wrap up. Even though we went for an hour and 24 minutes in the word. It, it, again, I, I can't apologize enough for last week and apologize to my coworkers who came over to the house who I did feed and get drunk. But still, I feel bad because the quality was just so bad and it was a shitstorm of bad things that happened that, that cause quality. We will not have that happen again. And we will re-record. We will redo 21 at some point and make it better, which will probably be our second pubcast if I had to pick, uh, get the get the gang back together. Because there's good stuff. If you can make it past the sound, there's kind of good stuff there. But. Oh, sure. No, I had fun. Like I it's, said, my, my idea for this podcast came out of that podcast because they were all <laughs> talking about what affected them. Yeah. And I was like, I wanted to talk about foreign film, but I feel like I don't want to feel like lecturing or feel like I'm trying to teach a class on anything. Today we're going to go over the 60s. 
So, and, <laughs> and this year, somebody, this film came out. It was called what? Anybody, anyone? 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 anyone. <laughs> All right, guys. This has been The New Way with Ben and Matt. Uh, once again, to congratulate Ben and his lovely Thank you wife, again. Beth, I who is uh, in, in the house right now with the twinsies and the dog and probably wondering when the loudmouth Matt will stop talking and keeping her children up. But uh, as always, catch us on our website, everywhere. Please send us your thoughts, comments, complaints, anything. Just talk to us. We'd love to hear from you. Hope you enjoyed this week's uh, episode of The New Way with Ben and Matt, and we'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>